Hello everyone, and welcome to my Days of Our Lives 24 channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Harris stands up to Clyde at Statesville. In the meeting region at Statesville, Clyde jeered when Harris blamed him for being behind Salem's medication dealing ring. Utilizing illusion, Clyde said that Harris would be the kind of worker he would keen on recruit. Before long a while later, Clyde conceded that he had been leading Harris on, and he boasted that Harris was feeble. Harris charged that Clyde was liable for the medication ring, and he hollered that he would find the verification to close Clyde down. Clyde grinned when he referenced Lucas beating at the jail. Clyde was told by an enraged Harris that Lucas's survival was a blessing. Clyde told Harris not to squander his energy on the medication cartel. Harris referred to his experience as a naval force seal, and he inquired as to whether Clyde genuinely needed to pursue him. When Harris stated that he had nothing to lose, Clyde laughed. Clyde added that Harris would have just himself to fault assuming somebody near Harris was harmed. Clyde was warned not to approach anyone Harris cared about as Harris became increasingly agitated. Clyde kept sneering and laughing after Harris left. At Alex and Teresa's condo, Alex was irate when he strolled in on Teresa and Brady kissing. Teresa asked for absolution. Alex didn't say anything. Brady persuaded Teresa to go to AA gatherings. Teresa concurred, and she swore that she wouldn't let Brady or Tate down. Brady made a deal to avoid let Tate know that Teresa had experienced a backslide. If Teresa felt like using again, she agreed to contact Brady, Alex, or Maggie. After Brady left, Teresa let Alex know that she would comprehend if he had any desire to end things between them. Alex said that he didn't, yet he moped that Teresa had gone to Brady. Teresa conceded that she couldn't say whether she might have overcome the morning without Brady. Alex inquired as to whether Teresa actually cared deeply about Brady. Teresa consoled Alex that she had no heartfelt affections for Brady. When inquired as to whether he believed her, Alex didn't say anything. Teresa said that it was generally a positive thing assuming she moved out and got back to California. I ought to accompany my mother. Furthermore, I ought to get myself to a superior spot until I can see Tate, Teresa added. Brady told Maggie about Teresa's relapse at the Brady pub. Maggie proposed to accompany Teresa to an AA meeting. Brady agreed, noting that he had previously discussed attending meetings with Teresa. Maggie said that she was there for both Brady and Teresa. Outside the Brady bar, a noticeably upset Steve told Maggie that Constantine was exploiting her and that Constantine must be halted. Maggie dissented, and she shouted at Steve that she wouldn't tune in. At the point when Maggie referenced Victor's dim past, Steve said that Victor and Constantine ought not be looked at. Maggie said that anything occurred among her and Constantine was not Steve's concern. Steve became surrendered, and he requested that Maggie watch out. After Steve left, Maggie contemplated whether Salem was the best spot for Constantine, considering that he was being hassled by Steve and others. Constantine excused Maggie's interests. Maggie consented to meet Constantine at the Kiriaki's house later. John looked old and unwashed as he drank coffee at Marlena and John's penthouse. John appeared to be somewhere out in dreamland as he laid on the lounge chair. What's everything mean? He questioned himself. Marlena entered, and she frightened John when she put a hand on him. John apologized, and he conceded that he had gone one more night without rest. Marlena asked John to tell her for what good reason he wasn't dozing. John said that he was fine and that he had just been considering Tate and Brady. At the point when Marlena squeezed John for additional responses, John said there was nothing more going on. John and Marlena kissed before she left. Steve showed up shortly after. He discovered that John had been having bad dreams. John said that he couldn't remember his fantasies. However, I have discovered that when my brain begins going to these dim spots, this is on the grounds that it's attempting to let me know something and it's bad, John said. Steve referenced his spat with Constantine before, and he regretted that Maggie was as yet incognizant in regards to Constantine's appeal. Steve and John should take a different approach to Constantine, according to John. I believe it's time we simply ease off, John said. 
John contemplated that the more he and Steve attempted to persuade Maggie that Constantine was inconvenienced, the more Maggie would develop to disdain John and Steve. John went on to say that Steve and he would give Constantine just enough rope to hang himself if they were careful. Steve hesitantly consented to John's thought. On out, Steve urged John to get some rest. John offered a go-ahead as Steve left. At the karaoke's house, Constantine looked over a book in a closet space. Inside the book, Constantine tracked down a red card. I at no point ever figured I would see you in the future. Pawn, Constantine said with a sneer. Constantine murmured to himself as he stared at the card. Eventually, he laughed. Steve took a shot from the Brady Pub's bar at the same time. Damn it, elderly person. Is it really possible? Steve pondered. In the dimly lit corridors of Statesville Correctional Facility, tension hung thick in the air like a storm cloud ready to burst. The clinking of metal against metal echoed through the narrow passageways as inmates shuffled along, their faces etched with a mixture of resignation and defiance. It was within this grim atmosphere that Harris, a seasoned and weathered prison guard, found himself on a collision course with Clyde, a notorious inmate whose reputation for trouble preceded him. Harris, a man of few words but with a steely resolve, had earned the respect of both inmates and fellow guards alike during his years at Statesville. He patrolled the cell blocks with an unwavering sense of duty, his gaze sharp and vigilant. Clyde, on the other hand, was a different breed altogether. A hardened criminal with a rap sheet that seemed to stretch into infinity, he had an air of arrogance that grated on the nerves of even the most stoic prison staff. The confrontation between Harris and Clyde had been brewing for weeks, a slow burn fueled by a series of minor infractions that hinted at a more significant clash on the horizon. Whispers of discontent had circulated among the inmates, each rumor painting a different picture of what would happen when the inevitable clash occurred. Some predicted an explosive altercation that would shake the very foundations of the prison hierarchy, while others foresaw a quiet power struggle that would unfold in the shadows. As Harris turned a corner, he spotted Clyde leaning against the cold, unforgiving bars of his cell. The predatory glint in Clyde's eyes didn't escape Harris's notice, and he squared his shoulders, ready for whatever might transpire. The cell block fell silent as the two locked eyes, the unspoken tension escalating with each passing moment. Clyde, ever the provocateur, broke the silence with a sinister smirk. Harris, my man. What brings you to my humble abode today? His tone dripped with mock civility, but everyone present could sense the underlying current of hostility. Harris remained stoic, his jaw clenched. He had dealt with confrontations before, but there was something about Clyde that set him on edge. Cut the act, Clyde. You know why I'm here. Your antics won't fly under my watch. Clyde chuckled, the sound sending shivers down the spines of those within earshot. You've got it all wrong, Harris. I'm just trying to survive in this hellhole. Can't blame a man for looking out for himself, can you? Harris took a step closer, his gaze unwavering. Survival doesn't justify the chaos you're causing. It ends now, Clyde. I won't let you disrupt the order of this prison any longer. The confrontation reached a boiling point, the air thick with the unspoken threat of violence. Other inmates peeked through their cell bars, their eyes reflecting a mixture of fear and anticipation. The clash between Harris and Clyde seemed inevitable, a collision of two forces that had been on a collision course since the moment Clyde stepped foot inside Statesville. As the tension escalated, only time would tell whether the confrontation would be a flashpoint that reshaped the power dynamics within the prison or a mere footnote in the ongoing struggle for control within its cold, unforgiving walls. Statesville held its breath, a powder keg waiting for a spark to ignite the inevitable explosion. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.